From ABC News, this is Turning Point, tonight with Diane Sawyer. In every story, there is a turning point, a moment when history hangs in the balance, when lives change forever, tonight. That's me. Yeah. 20 years ago, Fred's diagnosis would have been a death sentence. You're gonna come back next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for some more radiation and chemotherapy. More radiation. Now, Fred's story is a story of miracles and the hard work and love it takes to make them happen. You already know what to do, Jim? Tonight, Meredith Vieira with the I'll toughest, sweetest kids you'll ever know. How much did it hurt? About that much? We don't like germs. We don't like germs. Germs, no way. I do way, you fly! You'll learn the science, which has changed their odds. His life, in a manner of speaking, is, uh, is secured in this freezer and meet the parents who will do whatever it takes to keep their children alive. And I remember them just praying that we would get to radiation. I'll take anything. Just get me to radiation. A child's last chance. Come on, boy, you're gonna do it. Come on, Fred. A mother's vigil and a celebration of life and hope. Turning Point. Tonight, The Littlest Heroes. Good evening. I'm Diane Sawyer. Welcome again. I'm going to go out on a limb tonight and predict that by the end of tonight's Turning Point, you're going to feel you have a brand new friend, a little boy named Fred, and perhaps a brand new reason to believe in miracles. 30 years ago, only 3% of the children diagnosed with leukemia survived more than a few years. Today, nearly 75% of the children will be cured. But of course, a diagnosis of childhood leukemia is devastating news for a parent. Yet, as you'll see, it transforms some of them into incredibly courageous soldiers on the front lines of a war they never wanted to fight. Tonight, Chief Correspondent Meredith Vieira takes us into their world for an amazing story of the medical skill, love, and sacrifice that go into creating miracles. Turning Point, with Chief Correspondent Meredith Vieira, John Donvan, Deborah Amos, and Don Cladstrom. Tonight, The Littlest Heroes. Turning Point, The Littlest Heroes, continues. Four-year-old Fred Ancona has leukemia, cancer of the blood. His doctors say his best chance for survival is a bone marrow transplant. Come on, Fred, back up. It's flying. His mother, Linda, has taken leave from her waitressing job in Rhode Island to care for her only child full-time. Put him in the bowl. Let me have that one. Now, wait. Tell them what that picture is. I can't. Oh, well, that picture, Fred's in a fishing tournament, and he won the junior division with a 14.5-pound bass. And he has a trophy coming, and we're going to be in Boston getting the transplant when it's trophy time, but we'll get our trophy when we get back. What about this one, hon? Who's this? That's me. Fred and his baby tux. This is Fred at six months old. Fred was diagnosed at 10 months, so at six months, he could have had leukemia. Maybe he didn't. I, no one knows. Um, but he looks perfectly healthy there to me at six months old. This is taken in November of 92. Fred relapsed in January 93. We can't not go for transplant. We have to go. Because that's what they say is going to save his life. Chemo didn't work. He relapsed on the chemo program. We don't have a choice. My husband and I will do okay. We've been through this, and we'll stick it out to the end. But it's Fred that's going to be going through the hell up in Boston. He's a good, strong boy. I just hope he's strong enough. That's Sebastian. That's Founder. That's Ariel. This is 
That's the stone. This is Bambi, and that's the butterfly. Fred's already an old timer at the Children's Hospital in Boston and the Dana Farber Cancer Institute next door. For kids like him, this place has become a home away from home. That's a birdie. Some 50 children with leukemia come here each year. Not long ago, many never made it out. But recent medical advances have made leukemia one of the most curable of all childhood cancers. These days, 70 to 80 percent of children diagnosed with leukemia survive. But the treatment is still long, painful, and sometimes as deadly as the disease. And for any one child, it's still an all or nothing proposition. When we talk to the parents, we say, this is a disease that is universally fatal if not treated. If we don't treat, your child will die. The family has to know that this is the way it is. The, the cold, hard facts. All of them. So what are you really asking of these parents, then? We're asking them to put their complete trust in us and to really place their child in our hands for some period of time, a window of time in the child's life, where they really let us make some major life decisions so that at the end of that period of time, they have their child back whole cured. You can't guarantee that you'll deliver them their child back. We never guarantee, and they, they know that right from the very beginning. Fred, this is the plan. I'm going to talk to you and your mom and your grandmother. Here's what we're going to do. We finish the spinal tap. Yeah. I'm going to assume that it's fine. Yeah. You're going to come back yeah. next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for some more radiation. Yeah. More radiation. You come in, you get it, and you go home. And then that Sunday night, you check in, we give you yeah. more radiation and chemotherapy, and then we're going to give you back more. your bone marrow. Yep. And then we're all finished. All done? All done. And the transplant. You forgot the transplant. Oh, the transplant. I forgot the transplant. And then we'll give you the transplant. There. OK, and then you just have to hang out. You hang out all of August, and we'll send you home in September. That's the deal. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> you don't put your foot on beds. Who is that? Pete. What Pete. is Pete? A duck. When did you get Pete? Where were you? I was in the hospital. That's right. And what had they told us was wrong with you? What did they say was wrong with you? I had cancer. That's right. And what about what kind of cancer? Leukemia. What do we have to do about keeping all those bad leukemia cells away? What are we going to do? Take medicines and back tests. Medicines and back tests. For a long time? Yeah, for a long time. How long? Do you know? Jill Hartel is also four. But unlike Fred, her chemo is working. The cancer has gone away, at least for now. Before diagnosis, Jill had mysterious bruises and persistent fevers, but nothing that shouted out cancer. It seemed like that nurse's station was so far away. Jill's mother, Lisa, tells a familiar story. One day, she thought she had a healthy daughter. The next, she got an emergency call at the high-tech company where she works and was suddenly living in the hospital, sleeping on a cot next to Jill's bed. A new admit gets a single room, a private room, all the time. And um, so, Why is that? Um, uh, you couldn't have anyone else in the room because you're going through so much. Um, literally, all you're doing, um, whether you're male or female, is crying for about three, four, five days, yeah, um, you, and, and you need your privacy. You've got to figure out now what this means. For the first month after diagnosis, children here are bombarded with huge doses of chemotherapy. The goal is to get them into remission as quickly as possible. But the toxic drugs used to destroy leukemia cells eat away at the throat and stomach, causing sores and vomiting. They attack the immune system, leaving the child weak and vulnerable to infection. I remember how 
horrible it was to me every time I heard that all her hair was going to fall out. She had the most gorgeous, I mean, it was just like all these blonde locks and they were curls all over her head. And I, I said, this is barbaric. This, you can't tell me that you haven't gotten further than this. How could this be making her hair fall out? And now that seems so minor. It took Jill longer than most kids to go into remission. By the time she rejoined her twin sister, Lauren, in nursery school, even the way they play had changed. I am the doctor. Okay, now what's wrong? Special radiation. I will put some special radiation in him, too. Now let him lay down like this. I want him to lay down. That wasn't his medicine. Oh, wait, I need to walk Today, Jill is feeling better, but she's far from cured. There are years of checkups, care, and chemo ahead. Jerry Mullen was diagnosed about the same time as Jill, and like Jill's parents, his work nonstop to keep his cancer at bay. You want to go? Yes, who I am. The Knights of Justice. Oh, the Knights of Justice? Oh, you're the good guy, I'm the bad guy. Ah! I wanted to know if he was going to live or die. I didn't, I, I didn't care if I had to carry him on my back for the rest of my life. I was willing to do that, but I wanted him to live. This is Jerry's um, 6MP, which he takes for 14 days, and that is a chemotherapy drug that he takes by mouth. This is Jerry's dexamethasone, which is um, a steroid. Most of Jerry's care these days takes place outside the hospital at home. Lots of stuff, lots of stuff. His mom, Michelle, has taken leave from her teaching job to look after Jerry. Can you hold the line up for me, please? Hold it way up in the air. Living with leukemia has been made a little easier thanks to a plastic tube called a central line venous line, which leads directly to the bloodstream. Before the line was invented, children were constantly jabbed with needles. Now blood is drawn and chemo administered painlessly. Thanks, Jerry. We're all done. I know. Good job. OK, OK, I want to make sure there's no bubbles, and then you can push. Bubbles will hurt you. Why can you hurt me, Mommy? It'll go into your heart, and that's not good. OK, push. Nice and clear. Parents right, who once knew nothing down. of medicine practically become experts just caring for their down. kids. OK, thank you, buddy. This is Jerry's chemotherapy Can you that's it, going in now. You'll see it, you the line it, filling up with yellow. This chemo has gone through here and all the way up into there. It's a tremendous amount of care. It doesn't see, you know, when I talk about it now, it, do, it seems overwhelming to me. This is my life, and this is what I do. It stinks, but this is what I do to help Jerry out. And that's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Nah. Fred is back at Children's Hospital for the day yeah, to begin the process that will culminate in his transplant. I felt, I'm still with you. The only way left to attack his cancer is at the source, Fred's bone marrow. I didn't want to make a wish. No. Stand up. Well, look, we can put movies in there. Did I bring any? Yeah. I did. What movies did I bring? But where are I? They're in the car. Daddy will go get them. Oh. What movies did I bring? We have Mom Black, Batman, and Hook. What else? What else? Uh, I don't remember. Pinocchio. I bought Pinocchio. You show me shirt. We like Pinocchio. That's him. Pinocchio and Jimmy Ticket. In order to transplant Fred, he needs to have some bone marrow. And because there was no brother or sister or even computer match donor whose bone marrow was available, we had to use Fred's. Then take bones right here. Yeah. Where are they going to do it? Take bones from there. Bone They're going to take bone marrow from back here. Back there. Right. Now what are they going to put it in? What? What do they do with the bone marrow after that? What? Put it in the... Uh... Free it. Freezer. That's right. Put it in the freezer. Take 
We have to make it tall. Why? <laughs> Why? That's just the way they That's make it the cold. It they freeze it. They freeze it till we need it in a couple weeks. So no germs get in it. In it. Has no germs in it. Say we don't like germs. We don't like germs. Germs, no way. I do way you fly. We're ready to roll. Okay, Fred. What? Let's go. Get this done with so you can come back and see your mom, okay? I'll give you a ride. Love you again. Oh. No, no, no. <laughs> Take good care of them. We're what Parents know that transplants work only half the time. They also know that when transplants don't work, there are no options left. I have two children of my own, and very frequently, almost as a rule, people will ask you, doctor, put yourself in our position. If this was your child, would you be doing the same thing? There comes from you two different answers. There's the intellectual answer, which is always yes. I don't think you'd ever think of telling someone else to do something for their child you wouldn't do yourself. But there's always that other answer that seems to me an even uh, clearer, deeper truth, which is, I don't know. Okay, Fred. Seventeen days before Fred's transplant, doctors remove a pint of his diseased bone marrow. What this procedure does is permits us to take some of the seeds from his bone marrow, if you will, the mother cells to his blood, called stem cells. We'll be left with about a tablespoon full of, uh, of cells. And in that tablespoon, will be enough seeds to sustain him for the rest of his life. <laughs> Talking to people about options that, at best, have a 50-50 chance of working, and at worst, are delivering something that will be lethal for their child, no matter how routine it is in, in your own life, the fact that these are somebody else's children never really leads you. It went remarkably well. <laughs> uh, they're all finished. So I'm sure it'll be OK. And I'll be by and see you before you go home this afternoon. Mm -hmm. okay. See you then. The very next day, Fred is back in Rhode Island with his family. While his bone marrow sits in a Boston lab being cleansed of leukemia cells, Fred gets to go fishing one last time before his transplant. Turn now to the world where, for doctors and parents, every decision is a crossroad, every checkup a critical marker, every day a chance for the children to show their astonishing resilience. Jill Hartel is back at the clinic for one of her regular checkups. You already know what to do, Jill? Yeah. Stick your tongue out. Have uh... they done that before? Oh, you have? I do this all done the time. it lots of times. So what's he doing to you now? <laughs> Besides tickling you. <laughs> Tickles me, Tickles. Dr. Mark. Okay. I want you to lie down. Cancer that's gone away Which often comes next? back. And even when it doesn't, there are no. other concerns. Chemo has made Jill so susceptible to infection that a simple illness could be critical. Why does he have to check you so much? Because if he doesn't check me every week at the clinic, then I'll get an infection. And if I get an infection, I'll have to go back to the hospital. Is he a good doctor? You can tell me the truth. Yes. yes. Doesn't hurt you? No. Nope. 
It's cold, isn't it? It's cold. Oh. So we tied up now? No. I'm in the lead? No, I'm in the lead. You're in the lead. Laughter and play are a big part of what goes on here, even when the side effects from chemotherapy get in the way. Jerry Mullins here, not only to be checked for relapse and infection. Long-term exposure to toxic drugs has weakened one of Jerry's legs. Oh, look at that. The crowd goes wild. Jerry, Jerry. These parents are consenting to having some very heavy-duty drugs put into their kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. And serious radiation in some cases. Absolutely. Without you really knowing the long-term effects. Is that true? We deliver a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we give them the best of our knowledge, but we also tell them uh, pretty routinely that there, there are things that we know and we're telling you, and there are things that we don't know that, uh, that, that you have to anticipate. Feels okay? Mm -hmm. You tell me if anything hurts, right? The ones that we, that we worry the most about are the side effects on vital organs. Will any of the drugs that we use or any of the radiation we use have any effect, for example, on their heart or their brain? And the answer is some of the treatments are toxic to those organs. It's OK. Got new shoes. Oh, they're fancy, huh? You try to give as much as you can to get rid of the leukemia and little enough to leave no permanent damage on vital organs. Come on, give them a big hug. There you go, guys. Where's your hugs? The Hartels and the Mullins became friends at Children's Hospital. I remember when the doctor came in to talk to us, and he was telling me that Jerry had to be brain radiated to think as he was lying there that Jerry's probably going to have learning disabilities. To know that in order to, to beat this, there's still another side effect that we have to deal with. You know, when Jill didn't go into remission when everybody else did, that was, that was the real hell. Um, and I remember then just praying that we would get to radiation. And I thought, if we can just get there, I won't complain about it. I won't complain. I'll take anything. I'll take learning disabilities. I'll take a bald kid for the rest of her life. I'll take anything. Just get me to radiation. And then we got there. Yeah. And then radiation was hell. But, I, but I've kept on my promise. I don't complain about learning disabilities. I'll, no, I'll take no, them. No. Get, I'll take Hey, learn by a list. Just let me learn by a pad of paper. Who cares? Yeah, oh. Who cares? You know, like they said to me, well, your son probably won't go to Harvard. And I said, hey, we have a huge family, and no one's going to Harvard yet. What makes me think my son's going anyhow? You know? I mean, that's not a big deal. You want to take some swords so we can play hook in Boston? No, you can be the mate with I'll be the mate. I'll be the hook. OK. You want to take this sword? You want to take your dinosaur? It's Fred Ancona's last day at home before returning to Children's for the final stretch. Where's Batman? Get Batman. We have to give him a bath, too. No, I, I, no, I will not well, let you. We have to wash him. No. All right. Now, you start washing your truck to take it to Boston. Get all those germs off it. I'm just washing this. <laughs> well, Fred's going to be in a germ-free environment. Uh, sterile, completely sterile. And I'm sitting here. I was soaking the toys in alcohol and soap. And hopefully that should do the trick and get them fairly clean. So the only germs that'll be on him when we get up there are his germs. OK. Four days later, Fred is in the middle of a week's worth of chemotherapy and radiation leading up to his transplant. As his bone marrow and his immune system are destroyed, Fred runs out of any defenses against germs. From here on, there's no turning back. Almost there. What it means to have your total body irradiated is that from the top of your head to your toes, there is a dose of radiation going through your body. And en route through your body, it is killing radiation-sensitive cells, which happen to be leukemia cells and happen to be normal bone marrow cells. We plan the dosing and treatment of the radiation in such a way that it does not kill 
vital cells that you need. For example, your kidney, your heart, your liver, your lungs, your brain. What tape are you listening to? Jingle bells. Jingle bells. I love you. <laughs> when we complete this total body irradiation, we're left with an ordinary looking child who just happens not to have any leukemia or any normal bone mass. So the only seeds that he has, the only way that he can make new blood are from the bone marrow stem cells that are in this tank. He could not live without these seeds. His, his life, uh, in a manner of speaking, is, uh, is secured in this, in this freezer. What if along the way there you did miss a leukemia cell, either in him or in that bone marrow? Is it automatic that that child will eventually develop leukemia again? We, we, we don't know for sure. But the presumption is one leukemia cell that's alive and well is capable of, of multiplying to a number that becomes fatal. Most children whose leukemia comes back after a transplant do not have any further curative treatments available for them. If, if the cancer com comes back, Fred will die. It's highly likely. Is part of dealing with this disease preparing for? Preparing? That possibility? I think of it often. A lot, I do. Um, I don't ever want to get there. But uh, I think about it, what that day would be like. Sad. Jill lives with this protection that um, little people don't die. It's just, you know, grandmas and older people. Jill came in to the hospital the second time, and she was sick. It was during radiation. She wouldn't talk to anyone. She wouldn't eat anything, and Jackie was her roommate. They became fast friends, and they called themselves Jack and Jill. We love Jackie. I mean, we owed Jill's spirits to Jackie. We, we owed our spirits to Jackie. She was, she was just that kind of kid. <sighs> and then Jackie died. Jill still doesn't know her friend died or how fragile her own life is. Every nine weeks, her parents must brace themselves for the possibility Jill's cancer's returned. Children in remission have their bone marrow checked regularly. It's a painful Jill procedure. Like Jill calls her back test. What are we going to do? Well, yep. Annie is going to get your line hooked up. I guess we better unpin you, huh? That would be easier, huh? Are we going to do a back go. test, Daddy? Yes, we sure are, sweetheart. Yeah. I know. Hey, but you know what I brought in for you to play with? One of my special bracelets. No way. Ooh. Just for you to play with. I don't yeah. believe mommy's yeah. going to let you wear that bracelet. I'm getting ribbon Christine now, too. Her parents oh, dread this test because if way, Jill huh? has relapsed, her odds of survival go down dramatically. Good deal. If you do a blood test and there's leukemia in it, then you can almost be sure that the leukemia is also going to be in the bone marrow. But if you don't detect leukemia in the blood, then you have to put a needle a kind of hard steel needle into the center of the bone, suck out a little bit of the fluid and look at it to see whether or not there's any evidence of disease there. Do you think I could wash your back? Would that be okay? It's that brown cold stuff, okay? Why do you put the bag? It's, it's just like a sponge. Yeah. It's too it's dangerous like to put a child under oh, general like a anesthetic every nine weeks. So Jill will get only a local painkiller and a drug that helps her forget how much this hurts. It's hard to see your child fall down and skin their knee. And uh, the pain for this is certainly a whole lot worse than that. And it's hard, too, because you know it's not just a one-time deal. There's one of these every nine weeks, or at least year. the next couple of years. Her parents will have to hold her still. How did it go? Champion. <laughs> How much did it hurt? <clears throat> About that much? Not this much? Several hours later, the Hartels are still waiting for the test results. Just that Jill? much? 
Just that much? That's great. Were you brave today? Are you sure? Tell me, how brave were you? At least <laughs> that right. brave. To the moon and back. <clears throat> you were terrific. <clears throat> Get me some more ketchup. Looks good. Looks fine. Oh. Um, good. Yeah, it's, it's great. I don't have the CSF result back because it's still staying. Okay. okay. What kind of percent? percent. Good. Uh, you know, you wait and you wait and wait for this, and then you get the answer. It's a phenomenal amount of relief. CSF. So now I can eat. Now I'm okay for another six weeks or seven weeks until I start getting okay. scared again. <sighs> Thanks. Okay. Big sigh. I know I shouldn't be scared for these pets. Finally, the day of Fred's transplant has arrived. The fact that we can take cells from a person, manipulate them in a laboratory, put them in a deep freeze, take them out, thaw them, handle them again, and then hook them up in a, in a blood transfusion bag and drip them in. The fact that these cells go from the bag into his bloodstream and find where they need to nest and grow. That program is really a, a miracle. But even though we've done it over and over and over and over, you know, it's been done hundreds of times, there's still that, that kind of spark of, wow, you know, how, how does this really happen? There's bubbles in here. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Hold it up just right like this yep. so the bubbles don't Can I read it? Sure. It says, Frederick Ancona. number. And that's the protocol B4 Risen. 726 is today. Mm -hmm. Buddy, check it out. There it goes. Look at it. After all the extraordinary preparation, the transplant itself is surprisingly simple an intravenous injection through Fred's central line. Now for his parents and grandparents, the long wait begins. Come on, Fred. Come on, boy, you're gonna do it. Come on, Fred. Turning Point, The Littlest Heroes, continues. It's been four long years of hospital rooms and chemotherapy, of anxiety and fear. But the next few weeks may be the scariest the Anconas have ever faced. No one knows for sure whether Fred's cleansed bone marrow is totally free of leukemia or whether it will begin producing the new cells he needs to get well. In the meantime, Fred's immune system is totally gone and an infection could kill him. The long waiting game continues. In the room next to Fred's, a 10-year-old leukemia patient from Tennessee has also had a transplant. It hasn't gone as his family had hoped. I like doing lots of things like playing sports, you know, swimming, fishing, things like that. And I like going to baseball games. This is Jeremy 14 months ago, the day he was diagnosed. He was nine years old. Before cancer, he was into sports. Now, he can't move much. I mean, a lot of his friends, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And that emotional hurt to a 10-year-old child, it, it, it's very, very deep. He cried many a night. He'd ask me, he said, Mama, why? Why did they not want to have anything to do with me? Because I look different. He said, I'm still the same person. Oh, inside, he's still James. 
They still change. She does the horrible things to me. Now look. Yeah, I do, don't I? <laughs> I'm stuck. You put a seven there, and I got my eight there. I know it's buried. <laughs> Only a three is on. I don't have a three. James' puffiness is caused by steroids, but his main problem is his new bone marrow, which came from his older sister. It was considered a perfect match, but for reasons science can't explain, a perfect match doesn't guarantee success. No. That's, That's enough. enough. I don't know what happened. You were way behind. Now James has what's called graft versus host disease. The new marrow is attacking him. You creamed me. What happened? I lost. James has a number of problems related to his graft versus host disease. These include lung disease. Uh, he has um, disease in his esophagus, which caused his esophagus to narrow down so far that he couldn't take any of his um, pills or solid foods. Some of this disease shows up in his skin and in his hair and in his nails, and that's why his hair hasn't grown back, and that's why he has the red skin rash. He's one of the brightest patients that I've taken care of. He's, he's got a fierce determination to stay alive. He's seen a lot of friends die, both on this floor and, and, and upstairs, and um, it's, it, it's been hard for him, but his will to live is strong. I got to go back home to Tennessee to see my grandfather and my grandmother. The Make-A-Wish Foundation, yes. If you wanted to go anywhere in the world, where would you want to go or meet anyone? And he said he wanted to go to Tennessee to go fishing with his grandparents, which they thought was a little odd. And because they normally don't have children want to go home and see their grandparents. They want to go see movie stars. And Jamie, one of his fa favorites is Claude Van Damme, and he said, well, we could send you to see him. James says, no, I want to go home. I want to go fishing. My dad and James have a very special bond because my father also has cancer. The cost of cancer is astronomical. James calls it a robber. It's devastating. Bill and I worked, uh, that's my husband, had worked 20 years. We lost all of our retirement money. We lost our home. I have a box, a huge box that bills I open up at $20,000, $30,000, $40,000, $80,000. You just put them in a box. You can't pay them. I mean, you pay what you can. Right now, we focus on the medication to keep James alive. Joanne Rayline is a nurse who works with terminally ill patients. I often wondered, why these parents leave their children on ventilators or respirators or life supports for so many years? It's the, you don't want to lose him. You don't want to let go. But I made James a promise. He asked me. He said, Mama, he said, don't put me on a ventilator. So I made a promise that I wouldn't. Well, when I, there was a time I thought I was going to die. But my mom, she kept my spirits and my hopes so, up, and I got through. Uh -huh. You don't think about that anymore? And I try to think about what's going to, you know, what's going to, what I have to do to help what I have now. Uh -huh. Everybody's seen how strong you've been. Yeah. That's his. Next door, Fred's no. strength is returning. He wants a bow? No. He wants a bow. All right. Don't hurt him. I'm defenseless. Oh His bone marrow is beginning to make new blood cells, which help lessen the oh, chance no. of serious complications. But he's still not out of danger. No, no, no. You gotta do this. this you gotta do that? Sorry. Am I doing yeah. it right? Get him, Fred. Get him. 
How you feel? Good. Good? I guess we're ready to do this. <laughs> we're finally going home, Jamie. Meanwhile, after 14 months at Children's Hospital, James Rayline is going home to Tennessee, his favorite place in the world. told you it would happen, right? You knew it would happen, right? Okay. Even though your mother and father were nervous, right? Not us. A Halloween party here wouldn't be one without you. I remember last year. <laughs> Do you remember the Halloween party and all the candy you had? I'll miss you, Joanne. Miss you. You're a good mom. You've done a great job with my son. Uh, you did a good job. I wouldn't have him to what you guys. He wouldn't be around if it wasn't for you. Right. So, James, do you have any more advice for people who are worried about childhood with me? Well, I can say is don't be scared and don't give up. Mm -hmm. Did your radio go off when you went through, Jamie? Mm -hmm. No, not like you did. James spent three weeks at home with his family near Nashville before he passed away. He died in his sleep, in his own bed. Some people believe that once you're told you have cancer, that you've automatically been given a death sentence, that no matter what you do, you're going to die anyway. But a lot of kids are making it. They are making it more so than they were 20 years ago. That does so much for us inside. What are you doing with this? Jerry and Jill are still in remission, but to be considered cured, children must remain leukemia-free for five years. They'll be nine before they're out of danger. Don't hurt me now. Come on now. Give me a kiss. We'll put it in here to hold 21 days after his transplant, Fred is being released from the hospital. You happy we're going home? Yeah. Yeah. What are we going to do when we get there? Play, yep. What are we gonna play? You wanna play trucks? Let me fix this. You wanna play trucks? Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy you're coming home. Mm -hmm. You wanna give kids? No, no. You look handsome. Hi, Drama. We're coming home right now. Yeah. At what point will you stop worrying? About the cancer and Fred? Mm. Never, never. They say that with time, the longer a child is out of transplant, the better chance he has of being cured. Yeah. Maybe I'll feel better in a year or so, or five years, when Fred gets to be 10 years old and no signs of cancer. I love you. But right now, we have 50-50 shot. I just hope we make it. Papa, who did this? We did. We did this, Papa. As best we could. Why? For you. I didn't go upstairs yet. But I will tomorrow, maybe. That I see the new bathroom. Does Grandma get a hug? Oh, does Grandma get I love you, my little boy. Oh, I love you. I love you so much. Mom has mints. Mom has mints, huh? Yeah. Welcome, <laughs> welcome. Oh, the yeah, even the cat's trimmed up for the occasion. Say hi to the girls. Hi. Well. Uh. Did you see the bathroom? <laughs> Did I see the, Did you see the, the bathroom? Littlest things, the littlest things, the tiniest the, things coming, pulling out of the uh, the hospital, the wind's blowing. He says, I feel the breeze. The littlest things that you don't even think about every day. And then he says things, and you start laughing. He's home. And he's home. Let's keep him home. <laughs> No more trips to Boston. 
As of her last checkup, Jill Hartel continues to test cancer-free. She's begun ballet classes and starts kindergarten in the fall. Jerry Mullen, who is in kindergarten, finishes chemotherapy treatments in about six months. And it's a happy time for Fred Ancona and his family. He's still testing cancer-free. And this June, his mom is expecting Fred's baby sister, right about the same time as Fred's fifth birthday. We'll be back with more of Turning Point in a moment. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. I'm Chris Wallace. Later on Nightline, the story of a four-year-old boy whom everyone wanted to help in the struggle for his life. Tonight. For a transcript, send $7 to Journal Graphics, 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203. To order a video cassette, use your Visa or MasterCard and call 1-800-913-3434. The cost is $34.95 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. Turning Point is a presentation of ABC News.